So I've started the meeting for the RX manufacturer. Um, I don't know when I should start. Off. Start. A very, a very good morning to all. Hello, Manu. Hi. Uh, welcome to the Indian Space Association's Space Tech Expert Talk webinar series. I'm Wing Commander Satyam Kushwa, and I'll be the moderator for today's session on bridging the gap geospatial technology solutions in agriculture. We have an enlightening 120 minutes ahead of us. Our distinguished speaker will guide us through the fascinating intersection of geospatial technology and agriculture in India, exploring both the challenges and opportunities. We are honored to have with us today, Dr. C.S. Murthy, former director of the Mahanagaboris National Crop Forecast Center, and the former group director of agricultural sciences and applications of the National Remote Sensing Center is here. Dr. Murthy brings over three decades of experience in geospatial applications for agriculture. He has been instrumental in developing and implementing national programs for crop inventory, surveillance, and risk management using remote sensing and GIS technologies. His expertise spans areas such as geospatial solutions in agriculture, integration with digital solutions, farmer-centric geospatial information services, and automation of decision support systems. Throughout the session, I encourage all attendees to use the Q&A function for any questions. We will address as many questions as possible during a dedicated Q&A segment. This is a unique opportunity to engage directly with a leading expert in geospatial technology applications for agriculture. Now I would like to invite Lieutenant General A.K. Bhatt, Director General of the Indian Space Association, to deliver his opening remarks. Good morning and Jai Hind to everyone. On behalf of the Indian Space Association, I warmly welcome you all and most importantly, the speaker for this fifth Space Tech Technical Expert Talk, a webinar focusing on bridging the gap geospatial technology solutions in agriculture. As you're all aware, Indians India's agriculture sector employs nearly half of our workforce. And today it stands at a critical juncture. The challenges of climate change, water scarcity, and the need for sustainable practices makes it imperative that we leverage cutting edge technologies. Geospatial solutions, including satellite remote sensing, GIS and location-based services can provide invaluable insights for precision farming, crop monitoring, resource management, and informed decision-making. A recent initiative like the Chrissy Decision Support System, YesTech, and WINDS have demonstrated the transformative potential of geospatial technologies in agriculture. However, bridging the gap between technology development and end use remains a critical challenge. Today's webinar will explore how we can overcome these hurdles and fully harness the power of geospatial innovations for our agricultural sector. Our distinguished speaker, Dr. C.S. Murthy, with his vast experience and pivotal role in major national programs, is uniquely positioned to guide us through this complex landscape. He will shed light on the current state of geospatial technology, utilization in Indian agriculture, the challenges in adoption, and the exciting opportunities that lie ahead. Your part, active part, participation would is welcome, and we look forward to you. Uh, my thanks once again to Dr. C. S. Murthy to find time to give us this very informative talk. Over to you, Dr. Murthy. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, and uh, it is my privilege uh, to be here to be part of this very important presentation. 
uh, I, I, I am extremely thankful to the Indian Space Association, uh, which has been continuously exploring new opportunities to bring technology solutions into various sectors. I had very good interactions with uh, Indian uh, Space Association officials or uh, experts during my stay at MNCFC. It was a very, very uh, meaningful interactions with ISPA. I am fully confident, I am fully convinced that uh, ISPA is a good platform to, to take the to ground major projects, geospatial projects in various uh, sectors. I wish that uh, ISPA, all the best to ISPA and its efforts. Uh, coming to the, uh, the current topic, the geospatial technology and agriculture, these are all very, very important topics I need not mention because these are the burning issues now. The Indian agriculture is at crossroads today because of various reasons. So it is very well recognized. And I hope you all accept the statement that digitalization and the datafication of agriculture value chain is much needed for the country. Please remember this is digitalization and datafication of whole value chain of agriculture is very much needed to improve the performance of Indian agriculture. And uh, we require the data driven solutions or evidence based solutions, a scientific approach for taking decision by various stakeholders. Various stakeholders, I mean, it is from farmers to policy makers. They are looking forward to take data driven decisions, evidence based approaches. And uh, it is heartening for me to see that even the progressive farmers, even farmers are looking for this kind of solutions in India today. And this is the only way to align our agriculture to our goals of income security, food security and climate resilience. I think uh, uh, this particular presentation, I want to focus on on the various opportunities, where are we standing right now in respect of utilization of this geospatial technology? Because geospatial technology is a prime segment in the whole digital agriculture process, because that is the power of geospatial technology. So it constitutes a very, very core segment in the whole digitalization or digital agriculture perspective. And in this presentation, it is essentially based on my three decades of experience in geospatial agriculture. I, I, am, I am talking about the whole ecosystem of geospatial technology. Who are the partners in developing these technology solutions? Who are the end users? And what is the linkage between these developers and end users? How strong is this linkage? So is the technology, is the progress in technology, is the progress in remote sensing technology, is the progress in data sciences technology commensurate with its end use? Because these two have to be balanced. Otherwise, technology goes on progressing. Our end use is limited. That means we are not reaping the benefits of technology. In that way, I, I, I am fully convinced this particular presentation opening it to various experts, certainly it triggers new thoughts, certainly it triggers new innovations. That is the hope I have. And with this positive note, I just want to make a very, very comprehensive presentation on the scope of uh, uh, the whole the thing, whatever I have discussed right now. Next slide, please. So, uh, I, I, I'm, I am making this presentation in two parts. The part one talks about the, the geospatial technology solutions. What is the current status? What are the low hanging fruits? What are the solutions that can be scaled up? What is the current, what are the initiatives of the Ministry of Agriculture or the initiatives of the states to mainstream these technology solutions? And then what are the emerging technologies? There are new technologies, new in, uh, innovations are coming, new tools are coming. What are these emerging things? What are the emerging opportunities? And what are the emerging requirements of stakeholders? So this constitutes the part one. 
roughly around 30 to 45 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. And the second part is on how, what is the current status of technology utilization? What is the scope for enhancing the adoption of technology? What is the current rate of technology adoption? And uh, what is the scope for enhancing its adoption? And is there any gap existing between these uh, stakeholders, between the developers and the end users? And how to bridge this gap? And what are the strategies? What are the measures to enhance the adoption of technology? Basically, this is uh, part two. I think uh, in, in this way, I'm just proceeding with this uh, uh, presentation. Next slide, please. I hope I am uh, audible and my voice is clear and my pronunciation you are able to understand. Yes, sir. So, yeah. This is the basic framework of uh, geospatial technology on the geospatial solutions development framework. Basically, the it, it includes the data from multiple sources, different types of data. They are sourced from satellites, they are sourced from drones, weather stations, and then uh, there are some kind of thematic uh, maps, thematic layers like soil, land use, whatever it is, and smartphones, it is a very good source of data, and then in situ measurements to field instrumentation. So these are different kinds of data sets. There are some are uh, spatial, some are non-spatial data. So this multi-source data is used in developing the solution. Now, the analytics is another important element in the whole process of geospatial solutions. So the data of different types are normalized and brought to some same platform. Then there are some data sciences, analytics techniques, machine learning models, and then artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning models, whatever it is. So basically, the large streams of data are analyzed most of these large streams of data is available in open source. Most of the data sciences techniques tools are available in open source. So these data, large streams of data are analyzed, interrelationships are developed, establish the relationship and produce the outcomes. What are these outcomes? We produce new tools, new information products, it generates new knowledge. So what are the potential use cases of this geospatial, whole geospatial technologies? So mapping surface features, this is a very fundamental application. Surface features in the sense whether it is a tanks, ponds, or something, uh, land covers, and the change detection across time and space. This is another important uh, potential use case, scalable cases, improving crop statistics, crop health monitoring, that is crop surveillance system, monitoring the crop from the beginning to end of the season, and find out whether the crop is exposed to any kind of risk and what is the extent of this kind of risk crops and crop damages. And another important thing is that uh, the agroforestry schemes. So currently this is uh, to, to make our uh, carbon sequestration or carbon neutral agroforestry is an important component. So you have very varied resolutions of satellite data mapping the agroforestry suitability. So like this, there are so many use cases which are directly or indirectly related to decision making in agriculture. So whether it is for the farmers or for uh, taking decisions during the season to minimize the losses, or it is for the policy makers, traders, and the uh, agri-tech companies which are operating in the country and then adopting the farmers and then providing advisories to the farmers. So a uh, diverse applications of this technology information products are currently uh, visualized, are envisaged, are already practiced by some agencies, some part of the country. Next, please. As you all know, remote sensing is the is the, the prime driver of geospatial solutions because remote sensing has got certain advantages. Either remote sensing by satellites or remote sensing by drones, whatever it is. As such, the technology has got certain unique advantages. If it is satellite remote sensing, it has got much more, many more advantages. It has got certain uniqueness. Today, if you look at the remote sensing satellites, so this technology is changing very fast. Today we have very wide choice of data with us, ranging from three to five meters up to 100 meters, coarse resolution segment, moderate resolution segment, and then high resolution segment. So 
very, very diverse choice of data that is specific to our application. If you want to monitor very localized conditions, yes, the data is available, three meter data, five meter data. And another important thing is this, we are now undergoing through the phase of called modern remote sensing. Modern remote sensing is characterized by wide choice of data, First thing, second point is that easy accessibility of the data. You know, a lot of data platform, whether it is a Google Earth Engine or Amazon or whatever it is. So easy access to the data is another characteristic feature of remote sensing technology today. Earlier, 10 years back, we used to download scene by scene and then do the analysis. But today, you are the, the data assets are created. No need for you to download the data into your system. The data will be lying in this original platform, your service provider. And uh, with this wide choice of data, it's possible to monitor the crops very closely, very closely in the sense from the time perspective, from the space perspective. That means from the granularity perspective. So that means we have the five meter data if you want to monitor at a localized conditions. You have 10 meter data with Sentinels, Copernicus programs. So with respect to granularity, also we have wide choice and with respect to time domain. So the temporal revisits, uh, repeats, temporal repeats have increased very, very significantly. Even if you want twice in a, every two days, I want to see that area. Yes, it is possible. So that is the, that is how the technology has progressed. And in the near future, the, the remote sensing technology is going to progress much further, much further because already uh, the uh, NASA and the USGS and the European Space Agency, they have already announced Landsat Next and ESA LSTM. They already announced with a wide range of spectral channels. I think they are taking the technology to the next level. And then we have NISAR mission, ISRO NISAR, L band and S band, uh, Sandrika Pacha radar. So these near future developments in remote sensing technology are very, very encouraging. They are going to be highly beneficial to Indian agriculture. So this is one set. These are polar orbiting satellites or remote sensing satellites producing the data. But equally stronger developments, equally advances are happening in the geospatial perspective. Today, we are talking about the third generation geostationary satellites. So they have more uh, uh, their sensor bandwidths. They are measuring more number of atmospheric parameters. These third generation geostationary satellites, Himawari Japan is a very, very classic example of 3G geostationary satellite. So these third generation geostationary satellites, they are producing the weather data using the observations from these satellites the weather variables are being generated at a much granular level. Today, the technology is there at two to three kilometer granularity level, about seven weather variables are being generated. It's not the rainfall alone, it's the temperature, humidity, wind speed. So all these parameters are being retrieved using these third generation geostationary satellite data. So this is how, this is how the technology is progressing, the remote sensing technology and this is all this whole technology of polar orbiting and geostationary, they are going to have very, very profound impact on agriculture to design new solutions. Next, please. So now if you look at the remote sensing images, whether it is the Sentinel or planet or whatever it is, basically they have this kind, this kind of information content in the remote sensing images. If you see that land cover is the basic, very fundamental information, which you can see through from the remote sensing images and physical features on the earth, whether it is a, a tank, whether it is a concrete structure, whatever it is. Uh, if we talk about agriculture, it is a minor irrigation tanks or any other uh, interventions that have taken place at the ground level, physical structures in your Mandrega programs or rural development programs and the crop distribution what are the major crops that are prevailing and then cropping system. This is a very, very important uh, uh, thematic content, which is less utilized, underutilized, and this is very much required for Indian agriculture. I will speak about this cropping system slightly later after one or two slides. And then the cropping intensity. This is another important thing. We have three seasons. We have three seasons 
how many parcels they are cropped in all the three seasons if you want to increase the land productivity one of the because we can't bring additional land so only way is that is there any scope to increase the cropping intensity so a large chunk of our zone area net zone area that is available for the country around 141 billion hectares it is sown only once in a season remaining two seasons the land is vacant so this is a cropping intensity mapping and there are soil moisture parts. so again there are various kinds sourced from various models whether it is a hydrological model or a remote sensing based land surface uh, based observed land surface models retrieving soil moisture data and then some hybrid approaches because a lot of developments are taking place on this of course the the biophysical indicators these are observables from the remote sensing data similarly the flood inundation crop stress this thing drought water logging and structural damage to the crop these are all the information content embedded in the remote sensing images so now we have to extract this information for extracting this information a lot of data analysis data analytics techniques are available in the open source next please so now here i just want to emphasize the the growing opportunities for geospatial solutions in agriculture the demand for the geospatial solutions is fast growing now because every stakeholder is looking for innovative solutions because they want to transform their decisions into some meaningful outcomes because subjective decisions and the qualitative decisions are not are no longer is going to help the agriculture sector whether it is farmer or any other person so the demand for these geospatial solutions is increasing and there are very very prominent or scalable use cases and these use cases i just want to put before you uh, next please This is the fundamental information. This is a very basic information, cropping map, crop mapping and uh, uh, inventory. It's a very, very proven application of remote sensing data, satellite data. Today in the country, this crop mapping is being done for some selected crops. Their accuracies are wide ranging, but some crops, the accuracies are very, very high, 90, 95% for rice, wheat, potato, all these things. Of course, the accuracy, again, it is a function of uh, the crop growing environment, how much diversified disease, small and fragmented farms and whatever it is. But there are certain crops, commercial crops like soybean, groundnut, where the accuracy levels are still less, 70 to 80. But a lot of research work is going on to bring more, uh, improve the accuracies. Hopefully for soybean and all these things, we can cover in the next one or two years itself with enhanced accuracies because soybean is a very important commercial crops. So this crop map from the remote sensing, spatial crop map, it, it forms a basic input to develop further applications. Today, uh, we are generating this crop information for some selected major crops in the country, and this is being used for taking some kind of decisions. And uh, some of the critical factors which the developer should consider while generating the crop map or uh, they encounter with these critical factors what is the bio window what is the availability what is the crop variability and is there any intercropping of course these are some of the critical issues and uh, of course these issues can also be sorted out with intensive ground truth data and then with because today uh, very good strong data analysis techniques are available therefore it's not going to be a major back uh, for the uh, enhancing, uh, putting more number of crops into the system under inventory of satellites. Next, please. So the archers and plantations, one is the field crops, archers and plantations. Here also technology has made rapid progress because here we adopt a slightly different technique for mapping the archers because here we require high resolution data of the order of one meter, two meter or three meters. So we require both uh, panchromatic data and uh, multispectral data because here we adopt a different techniques of uh, segmentation technique using the high resolution data and then using the multispectral data identify the signatures. It is some kind of a fusion techniques or hybrid techniques we adopt to map these plantations. These also very, very proven cases are reported where the cartosat plus lispore and then coffee plantations, whatever it is. 
Next, please. Yeah, so now uh, this is uh, one important uh, uh, issue I want to flag it out to all the participants here. Crop mapping is a proven application of remote sensing data, which is being done for the last more than three decades. But the end use of these crop maps, they are subjected to certain basic criteria. So I define this criteria as GAT, the granularity, accuracy, and the timeliness. This plays a very important role for adopting the crop maps generated by remote sensing by the end users. So many agencies are now developing is a government agencies or private sector agencies. And uh, most of the agencies are claiming their accuracies are more than 90%. And these, these agencies are adopting wide range of techniques. Somebody is using random forest, somebody is using deep neural network, somebody is using something else. And the timeliness is a very, very important parameter. When can you produce this crop map? Is it in the middle of the season? Is it in the end of the season or is it after the completion of the season? How early we can produce the cap crop map? That is a very important factor impacting its end use. And actually, this question is there in the minds of many people, many uh, decision makers, mostly bureaucrats who are working in state departments and government of India. The timeliness of giving this crop map. The pertinent questions I faced on many occasions is that, can you give the wheat crop map by the end of November so that I can plan it, my procurements and what it is? Is it possible to give the, how early you can give the wheat map? Is it by the end of November, first fortnight of December, second fortnight of December? So actually this is an important issue that has to be flagged out by the researchers, for the developers. So timeliness is a very, very important uh, uh, factor. So what I say is that although many agencies are giving these crop maps as a deliverable from their efforts in remote sensing, many agencies have failed to mention these criteria, GAT criteria. So somebody is producing the crop map at 5 meter data, somebody is doing it 30 meter, 10 meter, and then 250 meter. And everybody is saying crop map is 90% accurate. It's not possible. I think that this is the point of confusion among the decision makers. I think this is the point that needs to be resolved. So you need to explicitly mention what is the GAT of your crop map? So at what level it can be used? So people say it is accurate 90%. 90% accurate is at what level? Is it a state level? Is it a district level? Is it at village level? I think probably this kind of specifications, the product specifications need to be explicitly mentioned on the deliverables so that we can increase its end use. Next, please. So this is a very important application. Again, another uh, doable thing, uh, mapping the wheat crop sowings. How much is the early sown? How much is normally sown? Where is the late sown crop? Because this has got implications on making your assessments on production. The how staggered is the production that comes to the market from the still how much area is to be uh, 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 is to be harvested so to monitor the production and to take the market related decisions this kind of information is very very essential and this is a, one of the doable works from remote sensing next please so yeah so since we are having the 10 meter data and once in five days and the, with the five day frequency. Uh, now uh, we are tracking the harvest patterns of the crop. You can see the harvest pattern of paddy in the Punjab. So from time to time, every five days, we can track and we can find out how much area is harvested, how much area is, uh, is ready for harvest, going to be harvested shortly. And uh, what is the uh, area which is not yet ready, which this takes time. So this harvest patterns, tracking harvest patterns use, uh, using satellite data, based on this, we can estimate market arrivals. So how much is likely to arrive on a fortnightly basis or weekly basis? And uh, this kind of information products, and uh, they are very, very useful to take some kind of a market-related decisions. 
and also the procurement policies of the government and uh, uh, other agencies. Next, please. Yeah, so as I told you in my previous slide, cropping intensity, because we have three precise seasons, well-defined seasons in our agriculture. One is the Kharif season, Rabi season, and summer season. So a given field parcel is cropped in how many seasons, whether it is cropped in all three seasons or it is only one season. If it is cropped in all three seasons, we call it is a 300% cropping intensity. If it is cropped only two seasons to 200%, something like that. So currently our national cropping intensity average is around 140%, whereas some of the states, the cropping intensity is very high. Here, what you are saying is two states where Maharashtra cropping intensity is almost on par with the national average of around 138 or 140, and West Bengal, where the cropping intensity is about 180 or so. So to increase the productivity of land, one is that we have to see that all three seasons are cropped. What is the scope for expanding uh, the crops in all the cro three seasons? So for that, this cropping intensity map, which is now currently we, we can generate at a 10 meter granularity. This can be integrated with other layers, whether soils, slope, groundwater, irrigation, and so on. And do the analysis, what are the potential areas to expand cultivation to two seasons? What are the potential areas where you can occupy all the three seasons? So this kind of information, uh, value addition, you can bring and this is useful for planning purpose. Please remember this cropping intensity map can be generated only through report sensing and not by any other means. So this is a, a unique advantage of uh, remote sensing technology. Uh, for mapping this kind of uh, uh, intensity and other distribution kind of maps. Next, please. So now crop diversification. You know very well uh, it's a hot topic or burning topic. Diversify, diversify your crops from rice and wheat uh, to uh, other crops to achieve sustainable agriculture solutions and so on. So by using the crop maps of the past seven years or eight years or 10 years, whichever is available, we can we can map how frequently the rice is being cultivated in a given parcel. So this is one example what we have showcased. This we have done it for Punjab and Haryana, MNCFC. We have provided a lot of information to the ministry for taking decisions on the diversification of the crops. We can ident we have already identified the field parcels where all five years is growing only rice or is growing rice in two year, years and then we prioritize these areas. So you can bring further value addition to this kind of layers by superimposing various farmer database and the other databases bring a lot of value. You can generate a lot of new information products you can generate and take it to the ground level implementation. Next, please. So cropping system is another uh, important uh, uh, thematic information that can be generated with remote sensing. So here I am talking about one cropping system that is mostly practiced in Eastern India, East Indian states. This is rice fallow system. So a cropping system means it is a it is a sequence of growing crops. For example, in case of Haryana, it is uh, rice wheat system or cotton wheat system, whereas in case of East India, in this particular case, it is Kharif rice and fallow system. In Rabi season, they leave the land fallow due to various reasons. So these are called Kharif rice fallows. These Kharif rice fallows, they have the inherent potential to grow the next crop because this is all irrigated rice. There is a lot of residual moisture. And uh, the second season crop, these are the favorable areas to take crop in the second season, short duration crops. And from the perspective of our food security, I think that these areas are very rich for growing the short duration pulse crops. So this kind of uh, information uh, is possible to generate using the remote sensing and geospatial analysis. What is the Kharif rice fallow land that is available? And what are the seasonal conditions prevailing over these lands so that 
what are the potential areas where you can grow short duration pulse crops there i think this is a one important uh, technology solution and being adopted by the some of the states like odisha so they are doing the planning purpose and then using it, this information next please of course from the environmental perspective stubble burning is another uh, uh, practical application of uh, geospatial solution so where uh, the stubble bur burnt area fields the stubble burning fields where the burning took place this we can detect through the some kind of uh, special unique indices called burnt area index which can be generated using today with the sentinel data using certain spectral bands and uh, this is also a proven application which is being uh, done by uh, mncfc and other agencies in the country and uh, providing a uh, lot of information on where the burning took place and what is the percent area and then where the we can compare the current year burning with the last year's thing we can identify the areas whether it has reduced or increased and for some for interventions and others next please so of course uh, these are all uh, well known and there are many other uh, proven applications so digital soil mapping wastelands agroforestry baseline data monitoring whatever it is change detections so these are all well known i need not uh, tell next please so this is uh, one important uh, uh, segment of agriculture where the technology solutions are very much needed today you know all uh, the uh, crop uh, risk protection uh, of uh, crops from natural calamities we require parametric solutions that means these are all uh, data data driven solutions because the crop losses to natural calamities and weather extremes yeah, they are uh, uh, they are occurring more frequently in recent years and uh, we need to close these protection gaps we need to protect the farmers from these risks Today, we have two risk management mechanisms in the country. One is risk transfer mechanism, that is from insurance perspective. Another is risk relief perspective. Risk relief system, through NDMA, we have NDRF funds and SDRF funds. So largely, these two mechanisms are now uh, in place. But there is a lot of scope to improve these mechanisms, to strengthen these mechanisms, to make them more sustainable. So parametric solutions for risk uh, risk management solutions, risk management in agriculture. I think this, this is a lot of uh, debates are going on on this. And uh, even the um, in NDMA, the disasters covered by NDMA, uh, like floods, cyclones, and uh, forest fires, lightning. And here also the NDMA is interested to generate to develop some kind of parametric solutions and roll out and then uh, for the for the benefit of uh, uh, the affected people next please now we take the case of PMFBY the risk transfer mechanism the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana which is a this is a national crop insurance scheme which is following area yield approach so I can say that this is one area where the technology solutions are being mainstreamed in a very, very systematic manner. Gradually, they are bringing technology interventions into PMABY fold. This is very interesting example for India. So when we started the scheme in 2016, you can see that many stakeholders have come together, the government sector and private sector, we started creating a roadmap for technologies and started interventions, the technology solutions from 2017 onwards. The smart CCE, the entire crop cutting program, crop cutting uh, exercise is now being recorded through smartphones to check the malpractices, to check human errors. So there are such uh, special apps are designed, CCE agree app, and then smart sampling, a remote sensing based crop cutting experiment system was started in 2017, 18 itself. And then simultaneously, the PMABY team was scouting for new technology interventions. So we started pilot studies on new technologies, for example, yield estimation, 
or nationwide implementation of smart sampling. We started pilot studies in 2020 and 21. Lot of discussions with all the stakeholders. It's not the government sector alone, private sector, insurance, reinsurance companies. I can say this is a good a success story, uh, how the technologies are gradually being ingested into the system. So the major decision, the major technology program into PMA started uh, uh, in 2023, because we have grounded three major programs. One is the STEC yield estimation system, and then using technology and then weather one nation one weather portal wins and the pictorial analytics based on smartphone photographs so this is a very good uh, response from the states and then in 2023 stec was uh, overwhelming by the states a lot of uh, training capacity building agritech companies they are uh, part of the stec program and uh, in 2024, now the STEC is being expanded to other crops, and I will give you a little more details in subsequent slide. Next, please. So this is a one small but highly impactful solution in crop insurance. Just checking the discrepancies. What is the area insured and what is the actual crop? So there are many cases where generally it is a human bias. Human bias, the, the general psychology is that farmers ensure a for high value crop and grow low value crop. Because it is a very classic example in banana crop in some of the districts in, uh, in some of the states. They ensure for banana, but actual crop is different. In some cases, even the fallow lands were insured as banana crop because the the premium paid by the farmers is very less, so they keep insuring and then they can take the benefit of uh, losses for banana crop. So how do I check these kind of moral hazards? This is another very important uh, uh, small but highly impactful solution where the satellite data was used to check these kind of discrepancies and remove such kind of fields where the discrepancies were there. And by doing this, I think, uh, the governments have saved at least a few hundred crores of uh, uh, premium uh, in various uh, states. Next, please. This is one classic uh, uh, example where the paradigm of insurance has been shifted from the conventional manual cropping based system to remote sensing model. And uh, this is a parametric index, crop health factor. It has replaced the manual yield estimates. The first time it was implemented in 2021, we have designed this scheme in West Bengal. And uh, this is completely driven by data we call crop health factor. This crop health factor has replaced man yield estimates. In place of yield, we have put crop health factor of the current and past years. Crop health factor is nothing but a Biological composite index. It is an index based approach. It is an index which is very close to yield, which is very responsive to yield, which is very sensitive to yield. So, since it is completely driven by the technology and replaced with the manual system, the transparency has gone up, the moral hazards have come down, the uh, timely settlement of claims have been achieved, and the premium rates have come down. Actually, by implementing this innovative model of remote sensing based index based crop insurance system, government of West Bengal has saved a lot of money in terms of when the premiums come down because the premiums right now they are only 3% premium. In other states where the rice is being grown but remote sensing model is not implemented, the premiums are around 15%, 12%, something like that. In West Bengal, since it is driven by technology, there is no manual intervention. So the premiums have come down. So the adoption of technology has richly benefited both state and also the farmers. Now, since there is no intervention, the whole system is transparent. So what I want to say is that today, the, the technology, the data is available to, is available to such an extent under analysis techniques. We can also design this kind of uh, models, parametric models for crop risk management. Next, please. 
So these are the three national programs where a lot of geospatial data uh, utilization is uh, involved. The yield estimation using the technology that is the STEC, where the modeled yield, there are recognized models. The modeled yield is blended with the existing manual yield with certain percentage. So then the combined yield, the modeled plus uh, conventional yield, the combined yield, the blended yield will be used for loss assessment in insurance. I think uh, STEC is a, has made a very good impact on the insurance system in the country. And the many states are implementing this STEC program. And uh, it has benefited the whole insurance system, all the stakeholders in a larger uh, perspective. Similarly, we have WINS is another one important uh, technology intervention um, by Ministry of Agriculture with the support of other ministries. So this is the uh, augmentation of existing weather data infrastructure and data collection system and ensuring certain kind of standardization in weather data sets and bringing the dense network and standardized data sets to one portal called One Nation, One Weather Portal. This is the whole uh, uh, story of WINDS. So uh, WINDS is now in the implementation, is in progress. Hopefully after one, one and a half year or so, we can achieve the full uh, dense network. So once it is done, I think we have access to huge amount of uh, weather data sets, which are essentially very important inputs in various kinds of models of uh, crop risk management or crop assessment, including farmer advisories. So crop peak is another important uh, technology intervention where the smartphone based crop data repository field photographs. And today the, the data sciences has progressed, progressed so much, the feature extraction techniques from field photographs, they permit us to detect the crop, to detect stage of the crop, and also to detect if there is any structural damage to the crop or is there any water logging conditions, inundation. So these kind of things we can detect automatically using our uh, machine learning techniques or feature extraction techniques. And this is also one important uh, intervention through Cropic. And they, I think uh, we are going to set up a huge database of field uh, database repository where we can build a number of models for automated detection of the crop and crop losses at farm level or farmer level. Next, please. So this is how the, the footprint of YesTech today, there was very good response from uh, states. So almost all the states implementing uh, PMABY, now they are implementing YesTech. So right now, YesTech for rice and wheat, you can see these are the states which are implementing that. We have created an institutional mechanism because yes, tech, we are seeing it as a long term or a sustaining technology intervention. It is not a short term program. So we have created a structure. There is a technology implementation partner. These partners come from both government and private sector. We have empaneled private sector agencies to act as the implementation partners. And we have another layer about EIP that is called mentoring agency where our technology centers which are created by the government of india so these centers will act as a mentoring agencies and then we have notified the yield models there are about five yield models and the protocols were developed yes tech manual is available in the ministry's website and one has to implement the yes tech models as per the protocols without much deviations so that is the kind of a system the modeled yield plus manual yield, they are blended in certain ratios. And that blended yield is used for loss assessments. The intent is to reduce the dependence on manual system of yield estimation gradually. So because of various problems. So I think uh, YesTech takeoff is very, very smooth. We can say it is uh, reasonably successful there are certain implementation issues and the, it is being sorted out by the expert committee we are closely monitoring and this is going this is a, one of the biggest interventions of geospatial technology in crop insurance in india next please
so relief is an other Im important thing the the drought relief system again here also a uh, lot of geospatial data is being used in the drought relief system because drought manual was uh, uh, prepared was developed it was uh, first in 2009 the drought first drought manual was prepared where it was notified for the first time the use of remote sensing indices into drought relief or drought assessment system so we have fixed the protocols for drought assessment so that the states are following these drought assessment protocols making the things but still there are certain gaps in this so particularly with respect to the granularity of the data they currently at rc level or block level uh, requirements is required at finer scales and the groundwater data is less used because the groundwater data availability is an uh, is a, a little uh, some constraints or limitations are there we are sorting out those issues and then crop specific drought assessments is the still not being practiced in india i think this is one place where there is a lot of scope to develop uh, bring some innovations into the system so now the drought indexing system we the the requirement of the ministry and also ndma we are working towards developing some kind of a objective or indexing system for automated assessment of drought conditions and identifying the beneficiaries or beneficiary regions at least at villages what are the villages which are impacted this is some kind of uh, a streamlining is yet to be done this is a very good uh, opportunity for researchers to work on this next please so towards bringing all the drought indicators at one place uh, we at mncfc and ministry of agriculture we developed a web portal called drought monitoring system this is currently residing at uh, Vedas platform or space application center. Eventually, it will be brought to Krishi DSS platform of uh, Ministry of Agriculture. Here, all the drought indicators are at one place. So our purpose, our plan, our intention was that to bring the data at one place so that it will be available to all the people, innovating agencies, whomsoever want to develop further applications, more value addition, so all these drought indicators are currently available at this uh, particular platform and uh, states are using this data because they need not uh, uh, do go for any uh, regeneration of the same data again and again next please this is a uh, one important uh, point i want to sensitize uh, the participants here uh, flood impact assessment or flood risk management, particularly in agriculture, it has not still happened. It is still as it has not happened still. Although we are doing these flood maps for the last 30 years, the flood damage assessment, flood risk assessment on crop lands, it is still a big void. And uh, this is the uh, still it is not addressed. So the flood maps and the crop maps integration and assessing the crop losses with the support of uh, other data sets this is one important thing which has not been addressed till now in the country although we are generating flood maps and delivering the flood maps to various users but the impact of flood on agriculture it is still unaddressed area although this is a doable thing but this has not been done this not this has not been achieved till today next please so today there is a lot of scope to develop indemnity insurance products at parcel level because high resolution data extracting field parcel information and generating crop maps at parcel level and monitoring the crop at parcel level so at parcel level indemnity insurance products we can make a beginning in the country at least for two major crops rice and wheat this is one potential area where there is a lot of scope to develop innovations or solutions next please so picture based uh, crop damage assessments this is an upcoming area in uh, 
in insurance we have started ministry has started the uh, efforts through cropic where the smartphone data is there is collected continuously from the uh, smartphone field photographs we do the pictorial analytics to extract crop information and then based on that crop information the loss assessment and then the claim settlement will take place this is very important application for localized calamities under pmby next please yeah so this is a big challenge uh, uh, which uh, the decision makers at various levels are seriously thinking the integration or harmonization or you can say the synergy between the relief and risk transfer mechanisms because both relief and risk transfer they are addressing risk management so now these two mechanisms are uh, functioning as uh, two parallel systems so risk transfer and then is the what is the possibility of uh, uh, bringing them together at, at least to certain level certain overlapping areas and then uh, there are certain calamity specific parametric products like drought flood and hail storms this is covered all these things are covered in both relief and risk transfer so what is the uh, blending of these two as a top up on pmby or as a as a separate entity a small ticket insurance products parametric solutions i think there is a lot of debate is going on on bringing synergy or uh, uh, between these two systems uh, we are hopeful that uh, in a few uh, months or in a, in one or two years i think uh, some kind of harmonization take place between these two systems and here the geospatial data geospatial innovations are going to play a major role they are going to be game changers here so still a lot of work is uh, going on at various levels next please so uh, the ministry of agriculture has started the krishi decision support system it is a is an indian geospatial platform with all open source technologies so this has hosting the data from different sources standardize the data perform some kind of analytics with certain open source tools and uh, provide some deliverables for example crop surveillance information or crop maps so the the intent of krishi dss is to create some kind of a uh, open source system for sharing the data because data sharing is a one of the important issues in geospatial agriculture today in india so we want to solve this problem to certain extent so krishi dss is now gathering data from various sources since krishi dss operates from ministry so ministry uh, we are talking to other ministries other agencies to pull the data bring them at one place and then we designed some kind of a data exchange platform in krishi dss where people can contribute people can take the data i think uh, this is going to uh, be beneficial to various stakeholders who are interested in developing geospatial solutions or innovations in the country in agriculture sector next please so we are uh, basically the krishi dss some dpi concept we brought into krishi dss because till now the there is no dpa platform for geospatial solutions in agriculture i think some time back ispa has also raised uh, this thing dpa for earth observation system so this is the dpa for geospatial applications in agriculture so if we have if we can build this kind of dpi so much of the data much of the uh, analysis tools many of the tools they are easily accessible to the innovators i think that is going to trigger new innovations and make uh, very uh, transformative changes in the whole system so with this uh, larger perspective in the long term benefit uh, of the system the krishi dss is designed i think the beta version of the krishi dss was released uh, uh, i think a few months back we are going to improve it further and more details on krishi dss you can access from mncfc 
and uh, i think uh, now krishi dss some uh, for beta version uh, some access uh, uri uh, i think uh, web links are also being given the participants here they can write to mncfc and get access to krishi dss the first level uh, uh, access and the platform uh, you can see the features there next please so these all krishi dss what we do pull the data standardize them put them at one place share them next please So parallelly, we are also doing this uh, improving this crop estimations and the crop mapping and then crop surveillance and health and forecasting. This is a big initiative, Fossil 2.0. And the next, please. Next, please. So the in the emerging technology solutions, these are the upcoming solutions where high resolution satellite data, automated extraction of field parcel information. You can see this, that is the data, and then this is how the field parcel information is extracted, the current field parcel data. This is being done for the whole India. We have some collaboration with some agencies. And the, this field parcel information is useful to, then it will be superimposed on the crop maps and extract information at the parcel level, provide the parcel level solutions, and so on. Next, please. So digital crop survey, I think you all know the government of India has started the digital crop survey where uh, the surveyors inspect each and every field parcel and record the data using the application, uh, mobile application developed with certain protocols. I think in the recent budget also, there is an announcement on uh, an expanding digital crop survey to many states. And uh, this information, that is parcel level, what crop is being grown, it is digitally recorded, and the information, the data is uh, curated, and finally used for various applications. And this is one important digital initiative, and where there is a lot of scope to further uh, develop a lot of downstream applications using the data. Next, please. So. How do you bring the synergy between digital crop survey and remote sensing crop survey? This is one important thing. Now it is going on in the ministry. We just started that work at that time. So where the digital crop survey recorded information, it is a huge ground truth database for remote sensing people. So we use that survey data to generate the signatures and generated the crop maps. So eventually what we want to do is that we want, because digital crop survey is a very expensive logistically and then time wise so we want to replace reduce the or reduce the dependence on digital crop survey at least for major crops so why can't we use remote sensing maps for example at least for major five six crops so that we need not do uh, digital crop survey for those crops for the remaining crops you can do the digital crop survey so in this way we are planning to optimize the two survey systems and harmonize these two uh, systems next please So this is one important application where the automated mapping of tree cover, these also upcoming application. There's a lot of uh, inherent potential for this particular application. Next, please. So anyway, this is one uh, important thing, farmer advisory, farmer centric geospatial solutions are not yet uh, uh, developed. It is still uh, work in progress. And uh, the benefits of geospatial technology has not reached the farmers. So if we for that we require a lot of granular data parcel level crop information parcel level weather information and with this kind of things and then i think uh, a lot of people are working on uh, uh, this kind of thing farmer advisory system by using uh, various geospatial data and other data sets next please uh, this is one important uh, application i want to flag it bring it to your notice as i told you in the beginning the third generation geostationary satellites the opportunities for generating a lot of uh, weather related information so this is a uh, what we say these are the some of the unique or uh, uh, new system of uh, geostationary satellites where the, the you can see these uh, satellites which are there listed out there uh, so they record the observation of uh, earth system earth and atmosphere in different channels in more number of channels and this data will be used to generate a lot of biophysical weather variables as well as the biophysical information products next please 
So these are the new data sets because uh, one of the agencies, one of the agencies uh, uh, working in India, it is led by some uh, ex NASA uh, scientist. So that agency has generated these data sets and they made a detailed presentation to the Ministry of Agriculture in 2023, last year. So they shared some of the data sets to the ministry and we have evaluated, MNCFC has evaluated those uh, data sets. So for example, they are generating uh, these the rainfall, solar radiation, wind speed. You can see here vegetation indices, FFR. So these weather variables are generated at two kilometer uh, resolution. It's very uh, interesting to note for us. We compare these rainfall data sets with the uh, other sources of data like IMD data or case in Karnataka state disaster management data. It's very interesting to know that these two data sets are in good agreement. So a lot of uh, agreement is there between the data sets of uh, geostationary rainfall and the IMD and KS and DMC. It's very interesting to see. I think there is a lot of potential in this uh, uh, new technology, in these new data sets. We can build a lot of applications using these data sets. For example, your parametric insurance products, uh, farmer advisory system, because these are very, very granular weather data. Next, please. Now let us come to quickly uh, the, the second part of this presentation is that, uh, so having said that there are many uh, proven cases of geospatial technology, geospatial solutions in agriculture. And what is the rate of their adoption? Are there all these solutions, all these new data sets or new information products or new tools, are they being uh, put to effective end use? So, this is the point we need to upon we need to think all the all the stakeholders uh, we need to uh, think that whether the currently available technology is fully utilized or not to understand that we need to we need to know about the ecosystem how we what is the ecosystem of availability and adoption so part two of my presentation focuses on this particular aspect because end of the day it is the question of uh, adoption technology adoption if the technology is available that is not enough are we effectively reaping the benefits of this technology up to their potential or not next please so this is the current framework of development and end use of technology solutions in india so there are two groups in the whole ecosystem. The first group is the technology development agencies. We call it as TDS. TDS uh, in this group, uh, it represents, there are government sector science and technology agencies, and then the private sector agencies, and there are some international research centers. You can see CGIAR centers, ICRISAT, and others. So basically these agencies, they develop geospatial solutions. They develop uh, new information products or new tools. And then there is a, another group called end users. End user group. This group consists of mostly the government departments, central and state ministries and various other government departments. And there are certain private sector end users like agribusiness industries who are procuring a lot of uh, farm output from the farmers. And there are certain rural agri rural industries. You can see everybody, uh, every industry, for example, you have ITC, Mahindra and Mahindra, CAFE. They are all having some farmer base. And then commodities people, banking, insurance. These are all uh, end users. In addition to that, we have farmer producer organizations, FPOs, NGOs. Broadly, we can categorize them as three uh, uh, sets. So government, private sector, and the farmer FPOs. So this is a system. Now, what is the linkage between these two? Particularly when you talk about the geospatial agriculture, what is the linkage between these TDS and the end users? So if you see this, uh, 
the government sector uh, TDAs and the government departments they have good dependence on each other their dependence is stronger dependence that means the end user group the government ministries government departments they depend more on government sector tdas and uh, they depend less on private sector tdas and also they also depend less on international organizations so they depend mostly the government to government interactions Whereas in case of private sector uh, decision makers, private sector end users, they depend largely on the private sector science and technology agencies, TDS of private sector. And to some extent on uh, international centers and to some extent on government uh, sectors. And of course, uh, the farmer producer organizations. So again, their FPOs and NGOs, they also depend more on the private sector s and agencies. So most of the geospatial applications uh, in agriculture sector in India, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they are in the uh, scope of the government departments. That is the Central Ministry of Agriculture, uh, State Department of Agriculture, Rural Development and so on. And the, these uh, departments, they depend on only on the government sector KDS. Although the capabilities of private sector are also, they are also equally competent but their dependence on private sector or international agencies is very, very limited. Next, please. I can say that there is a disconnect between TDS and use and users. So this disconnect, it is evident from the following facts. I think you all agree with these facts. The satellite based land use land cover maps are available from multiple agencies for multiple scales. But still in the country today, the LULC statistics is mostly sourced from BES, Bureau of Economics and Statistics, which prepares this data through manual estimates or manual surveys, you call Patwari based assessments. So, although LULC is the more fundamental application, one of the proven applications of remote sensing. And this application is practiced for many years, but still we are depending only on the BES data for LULC. Same is the case with the crop mapping, satellite based crop mapping. So the, you, you can see a lot of uh, articles that appear in papers, the need for improving crop statistics in India using advanced technologies. But still the crop uh, statistics in India is still dominant with manual estimates. And uh, as I already told, the another thing is that the flood mapping. Yes, flood maps are being generated for many decades, but flood impact assessments on agriculture, again, it is done through manual surveys only, I estimates and manual surveys. So another important case, which is globally also reported is the irrigation system performance assessment using various kinds of optimization techniques. This is the research extensively reported but nobody is practicing this, this optimization of water utilization, but nobody is practicing. Although the research is reported for 30 years, this is the global experience too. So based on these facts, what I can say is that there is some kind of a disconnect between the agencies who are developing technology solutions and uh, the agencies who are doing, uh, we are who are using the technology solutions. So there is a, some kind of a disconnect is prevailing. Had there been no disconnect, these applications would have been mainstreamed, would have been perfectly integrated with the system of crop statistics, perfectly integrated with the system of uh, land use land statistics, or integrated with the system of uh, flood risk management in agriculture. But that has not happened. That means something is missing. There is a missing link. That's what my argument here. Uh, next, please. Now, why there is a disconnect? That means, uh, what is the reason why there is a gap between TDAs and end users? TDAs are good in uh, their experts in digital technologies, new technologies, and developing solutions or whatever it is. But TDS have got limited awareness 
TDS have got limited awareness about the real world problems, practical problems. So, for example, TDS are not aware that today you require the crop statistics at village level. We require accurate information on the crops, accurate in the sense 90% or whatever it is. We require information at village level or block level. TDS are not fully aware. For example, if we take again agriculture problems, the crop risk assessment, when the risk happens, what is the affected area, what is the damage? So these are all the practical solutions, the real world problems and practical solutions. So TDS, another thing, mostly government sector TDS, they are aligned towards publication oriented research. We call academic research. There are huge number of publications on crop mapping, land use, land cover statistics. If you see for last uh, 15, 20 years or 30 years, huge number of publications you can find on LULC, you can find on crop mapping. But how many publications of these publications are translated into scalable and operational models is really worrisome. The success rate is less. And if you come to uh, end users, End users, they got good knowledge on real world problem. They also know what information they require to solve the problem. For example, a person requires, yes, I want precise information on where hailstorm occurred and what is the crop damage, the crop stage. And if somebody can come and take the photograph that gives a good information for me. So they know the problems. To some extent, they know what is the, what do they need to solve the problem what additional information they require. But they have limited awareness about technology. End users, whether it is the farmers or uh, higher level, highly literate uh, officials, whomsoever it is, it is not, geospatial is not their field. So they have limited awareness about technology, data, and models. On many occasions, they do not understand these publications and science. And also the technical jargon during their conversations with the TDS. This is a big problem. So that is a that, that is a reason why there is some kind of a gap, there is some kind of a disconnect between TDS and EUs and users. Next, please. So what is the implication? What is the impact of this gap? It's very uh, very clear, it is obvious. Because of this, uh, the disconnect, this disconnect is not between TDS and EUs alone and within the TDS, particularly the government sector TDS, there is a lot of disconnect. So because of this, what is happening is that we have observed this. Based on our observations, my observation particularly, I have document put these points. A lot of siloed efforts or duplication activities are happening in the TDS, particularly of government sector. Because within the same organization, different divisions are generating the crop maps for the same crop. This is highly I mean, isolated efforts, duplication of activities. That is the first and the foremost important observation. I hope you all agree with me. The second important observation is that these research efforts are not in synchronization with the end user needs. Before they start the research effort, the end user requirement is not properly taken care because they are not aware. And another most important thing is that these research outcomes, whether it is the government TDS or private sector TDS, many times it is exaggerated, particularly with the accuracies of crop maps. Everybody says it is 90% accurate. So whether it is the crop map is generated with MODIS data, crop map is generated with the Sentinel data or planet data, everybody says it is 90% accurate. Nobody specifies this accuracy is at what level. So, uh, the, the TDS mostly they have limited awareness on the uh, on the end use end users M end users they have limited awareness on the technology capability. So because of all these things, the adoption rate has become come down. That means we have not reaped the full benefit of the technology. It's very clear. So. If you say that uh, technology, the opportunities for developing technology solutions is at, at certain number X, 
the end use is x minus certain factor. So this minus factor, this discount between the development or availability and end use is mostly because of uh, the disconnect one and the and the selective association of uh, end users with the technology development agencies. They are very selective in association because of administrative reasons or whatever it is. They always want to associate with only one set of TDAs. Despite the fact that the other set of TDA is also equally competent and in some cases the other set of TDAs are more competent. But still because of so many other reasons, the natural alignment is to particular or one set of TDAs. So because of all these factors, this cumulative impact is that. So we are continuing our dependence on the manual assessments in agricultural decision making. This is the cumulative impact. So the manual assessment, manually sourced data is still playing an important role in agricultural decision making. Next, please. So how do we bridge the gap between the TDS and EOS? I think this itself requires a very detailed uh, uh, noting. It's very difficult for me to make a, because I'm also not very, very competent to uh, make such a detailed noting, but someone of some observations I have put it in my in this presentation on the basis of my interface with the ministries and industry and uh, other agencies in the country. So what I feel is that we need to revamp the current working arrangements. The alignment models. And the kind of these things we have to design the strategies to scale up these geospatial solutions. So we have to revamp the whole ecosystem right now. Relook at the ecosystem. Who are the partners, players? What are the collaborations? Why certain set of TDAs are untouchable? Why certain set of TDAs are uh, always uh, preferable? I think uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, what I say is that. Uh, biased outlook we need to uh, put a check next please so i have uh, noted down certain points and of course this is open for discussion whatever i mentioned here next please so what i feel is that we need to reorient the tds of government sector First of all, this is a very important uh, step one has to take. We have to emphasize the target uh, end use oriented research rather than academic or publication oriented research. And uh, there is an urgent need to minimize these duplicated efforts, reinventing wheel, duplicated efforts, silos, uh, not defining the quality experts more explicitly and the data sharing related issues. And another important thing is that these TDAs, although they do good work, their outreach mechanism, current outreach mechanism is very poor. That is what I feel. So you have to take the product to the end users, see that it is properly outreach is proper so that it is effectively. So they have the good capability. The TDAs of government sector has got the capability and capacity. But in the current setup, uh, working in silos, is a big uh, uh, inhibition or big uh, stumbling block to uh, enhance adoption of te uh, technology adoption rate. So a lot of duplication of efforts, they're creating only the, these duplication, siloed efforts, isolated efforts, reinventing the wheel, they all create ambiguity in the system. Now we require larger participation of private sector because their capabilities are fast growing. And uh, we all know the transformative role the private sector has played in the fintech revolution in India. This is all evident, no, needless to mention here. So why can't why can't the same private sector bring agri tech revolution in the country? It's possible. If you see the data sciences capabilities, the automation capabilities of private sector today, what is happening it is amazing. I think there is a need to set up some kind of institutional mechanism for easy participation of private sector in the agri tech, at least in agri tech, uh, these things. Then only we can bring some kind of revolution in agri tech. 
using geospatial solutions. The third most important thing is that quality, quality assurance practices, these are not streamlined in uh, geospatial agriculture products. As I told you, the, the specifications, as I told in the beginning, the GATT criteria, granularity, accuracy, and timeliness, they are not explicitly defined. It, it first many times I feel this is like some kind of uh, when I am having some contract with a loan agreement, there are some hidden terms and conditions. Once I sign the contract, I will come to know the hidden terms and conditions leading to some financial burden on us. Similarly here, because these quality aspects are not explicitly mentioned, the end users are worried whether it is really useful, a crop map generated by a certain agency, can I use it for agro-advisory? Can I use for, is it really useful? So there is some kind of uh, fear of facing negative outcomes is prevailing in the end users. They are not very clear because everybody says 90% accurate. Once you take it and start using that, then the, uh, the outcomes are going to be different. Next, please. So with respect to end users, I think uh, we are currently working in the mode of generating some short term projects. So there's some ministry has given project to some agency, some two year project or three year project after three years, everybody will forget. I think uh, we need to create long term systems rather than short term projects. Sustainable projects, sustaining and then it's a long term system. We are creating a system. A Krishi DSS is a long term system. It's not a two to three year project. It is a permanent system in the Ministry of Agriculture, Krishi DSS. STEC is a permanent system. I think this systems approach and timeliness, this is what end users have to adopt. And most important thing is that end users should keep vigilance on the overselling tendencies there in the duplicating efforts of technology agencies, let it be any sector, whether it's government or private. And the, my, many of the these technology projects are not being evaluated in the beginning itself from the perspective because there, if you make your evaluation in the inception stage itself, very strong evaluation, then one can visualize the uh, end use, but that is not happening. So the frequent interactions between the technology agencies and knowledge, these also, I think this needs to be strengthened. Another important factor I have observed during my experience is that uh, feedback on uh, on the demonstrated models for example a government agency has developed some solution and brought it to the ministry for implementation the ministry once he understands the thing they are unable to provide a, a candid feedback to the government agencies because one government department doesn't want to criticize another government department so in the process, whatever happened is that the government department which has developed the solution, they are under the impression their solution is perfect. The solution is not taken to the ground level implementation because of some, some difficulties in the ministry, not the limitations from our side. I think this kind of understanding gap is widely prevalent. So every government agency, they feel that whatever the map generated by us, it is very useful. It is uh, uh, it is not being used, it is not being put to end use because of certain other administrative problems of the ministry or some other agency. I think at least, at least uh, uh, to avoid this kind of uh, misunderstanding, it is better to give a perfect or candid feedback, whether it is a government agency or a private agency, and this is the solution, this solution has got, this is the plus and this is minus. At least that gives an opportunity for the agency to improve the solution. So anywhere, uh, these are the things and um, there are other very important measures. Till now in the geospatial uh, domain, what is agri-tech solutions, state agriculture universities participation is very minimal, but they are the centers of domain knowledge, field level problems and practical. So engagement with the states is very less. The, the, the technology institutions, whether it is the private sector or government like IIT, they are very good in technologies, but they don't have good domain knowledge. Whereas agriculture universities, they are very good in domain knowledge, but their level of technology understanding is less. Unless and otherwise we bring some kind of um, in, uh, collaboration between these two, so developing some practical solutions will always be a challenge. Similarly, you know, 
it is not clear what is the market size for geospatial solutions in agriculture. Somebody has to do this. What is the market size for geospatial solutions? For example, crop risk management solutions, if you develop, this is the, this is the potential and this is the market size. I think that needs to be done. That uh, some of the things uh, that needs to be documented. And uh, what are the models and algorithms that are ready for operational use? See, for example, I am saying that uh, PMABY, STEC, WINS are there very classic examples. So, like that, what are the data, what are the models and algorithms which are ready for upscaling, which are ready for scalability? I think this kind of thing we need to, somebody has to um, document these things. So, I think, uh, and uh, these are broadly some of the, broadly the measures uh, to uh, enhance the adoption rate of geospatial technology in Indian agriculture. Next, please. So, the, the conclusions are obvious, you know, very well. And then it is what we require today is agri-tech revolution in the country with the data-centric technologies. This is at least this is time. I think we have to do it in a very, very committed manner to modernize our decision making process in agriculture sector. Decision making by everybody from farmer to policy makers. We have to modernize them with the data. So with the datafication of every process, every decision making process uh, should be driven by data and data solutions because today a lot of data is available. Of course, the, the big challenges are there in silos not sharing, these challenges have to be revolved, uh, resolved. So some of the considerations, we can see that there are many low hanging solutions, like what I told you, the cropping intensity, cropping systems, and the uh, weather data, granular weather data, because the agencies, NASA, GeoNex project, they're already generating globally all these two kilometer weather data sets. There are all some of the solutions which you can readily mainstreaming, it can be done. I think this is the high time we need to revamp the whole ecosystem, existing ecosystem of geospatial innovations. So we find or to find some kind of uh, way, uh, possible way to engage more with the larger participation of private sector because private sector capabilities are really commanding, noteworthy. Similar to fintech revolution, we we need to bring some kind of agri-tech revolution in the country. So probably we require some kind of a DPI, DPA platform, which is DSS to some extent, this in the DPA uh, mode. Uh, probably that kind of DPIs for geospatial solutions in agriculture may trigger new opportunities, may overcome the limitations that are being faced now. So, so thank you very much. I think uh, this is almost uh, one and a half hour and then uh, i am sure that uh, first of all i thank you very much for your patient hearing i don't know how many people are hearing from the beginning to end so uh, uh, i think this uh, some of the points that are flagged here they are relevant and uh, all these points are open for discussion either now or through email communications or through any other technical interactions whatever it is but it is time to ponder it is the time to scale up geospatial innovations. In fact, Ministry of Agriculture has come out its own requirement of satellite system for agriculture applications in the country. Probably this is the only ministry which has come out very nicely. What is our requirement? I was very fortunate to work for that, uh, defining the constellation, working for that. I am, I am a strong supporter that, yes, India requires its own constellation of agri-satellites. Why should we depend on other countries? They may be facing, because we are, we are the, uh, right now, we are one of the largest consumers of uh, remote sensing data. So, the government of India's policy of self-reliance, Atma Nirbharata, why can't we have it here? Why can't we have our own systems, remote sensing systems, indigenous, remote sensing systems, because anyway, our consumption is going to be much larger in the years to come. So I once again, thank you all for spending your time and patient hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. That was a very, very 
uh, insightful and inspiring uh, presentation. We have a few questions. Uh, the first question is uh, that what would be the good GSD to support these applications and what are the spectral bands which play a crucial role in agricultural applications, sir? Yeah, so in, in case of uh, multispectral applications, we require the, the normal spectral channels that are available in the most of the satellites. That is the visible near infrared and the shortwave infrared bands. Because if you take the, right now, much of our uh, geospatial solutions in agriculture is through Sentinel systems, because 10 meter data. And uh, they have the red edge band. They have the, there are two shortwave infrared bands. One is operating around uh, 16, 40 nanometers. Other is at 21, 20 nanometers. So both the bands are equally important for us for agriculture applications. For example, trouble burning, you can detect through 21, 20 nanometers. Crop stress assessment, 21, 20 nanometers. But the more important thing is that now most of our applications are around uh, 10 meter granularity. What I feel is that if we have five meter granular data, five meter is more optimal. And I think it can open up many more new applications, new uh, borders. And that temporal revisit is very, very important. Right now with Sentinel, we are having 10 meters and the five day repetitivity. If this can be, if the repeat is increased to three days, I think, uh, during even during the Karif season, there is a possibility that we can minimize, minimize cloud contamination. So uh, C-band C band microwave data is good enough and uh, L-band data is coming up now, uh, but still some more applications are to be demonstrated using L-band data. So right now C-band data of microwave is also good. And if you get uh, that microwave also repeat coverage, uh, repeats of around five to ten days that's good enough so we can develop a good crop monitoring crop surveillance system uh, so there's a lot of uh, mention about the precision agriculture sir so uh, with respect to precision agriculture will these uh, resolutions uh, be adequate and uh, also uh, yeah. the land parcel yeah. sizes in india are small sir i mean with uh, over the generations, the land parcel sizes are reducing. So, uh, do you think that five meter resolution will be good enough to give adequate, actionable intelligence to the farmers once the adoption of the technology starts uh, increasing, sir? So, to generate land parcel information, we require separate set of images, high resolution images. Sure. So that is a centimeter, 30 centimeters or 40 centimeters. So nowadays, uh, uh, extraction of parcel layer from the high resolution images in an automated way, it is also demonstrated model. The ministry has an understanding with Google and they are doing it. I think they want to do it for the entire country, provide to the ministry as uh, easy access. Similarly, there are some private agencies, agri tech companies working on parcel extraction. This is one thing. Once you extract the parcel to generate crop information at the parcel level, at the parcel level, there are certain big parcels, there are certain small parcels. So, so around, around, around three to five meter data, three to five meter data, we can extract uh, parcel level information on the crops. And also three meter to data is, a, is maybe adequate it should be it should be adequate to explain the spatial variability so uh, 3 to 5 meter data is good for precision agriculture solutions but if it is 3 to 5 meter data there will be a compromise in the spectral channels for example you don't have the sphere 2 channel in 3 to 5 meter data just they give you only ndvi but ndvi alone is not adequate so what I'm saying is that three to five meter data plus 10 meter data, you should try to use it in combination to develop some kind of a solutions. But for precision farming solutions, you require other thematic information. 
not the satellite indices and satellite crop maps alone. You require the soil related information at a much higher granularity. So that is the uh, important consideration you should keep in the precision farming things. So more than precision farming, using five to 10 meter data, at least, at least for some, for some farmers can we deliver a personalized advisory. We know the field parcel information, crop, crop health progression using 10 meter data and five meter data. Can we deliver some kind of a personalized advisories at least to uh, middle to big farmers? If we can set up, establish that use case, I think further uh, downscaling we can do, think about subsequently. Related question is how to scale precision farming solutions for large scale commercial farms while maintaining cost effectiveness? Yeah, cost effectiveness is one important factor and the large area adoption of precision farming in a cost effective manner. So you have to optimize certain, see, Sentinel 10 meter data is there or some other system with five meter data. You should judiciously use the combination of the data, try to optimize your cost and efforts. The some one, one has to work it out. One has to work it out and demonstrate a model, cost effective model. Till now, not, not much work has been carried out on uh, precision farming. Uh, just people have reported certain things and then published some papers and closed through the shop. After that, nothing has been uh, ground level, uh, nothing has taken place to the best of my knowledge. Uh, what are the challenges uh, associated with using geostatistical analysis on high resolution satellite imagery and how can these be addressed? Nowadays, your uh, data sciences has progressed to extensively. So you need not uh, go for uh, parametric statistics. But the one important, uh, see, today automation and uh, machine learning models, these are the two important things that are, uh, these are the strengths. When you use a high resolution data or higher resolution data, what is required is that your efforts on ground truth data collection will be more. That you have to see that your ground truth data is adequate to capture the variability that is represented in the high resolution satellite images. With, with poor ground truth, with reduced number of ground truth points, if you apply on high resolution data, you end up with biased outcomes. So that is the only challenge. If you are generating crop map with three meter satellite data, your GT points also should be in accordance with that. If you are generating crop map with the 10 meter satellite data, you require certain set of GT points. As the resolution becomes better, so your GT points also should be more accurate and uh, more in number, more extensive in nature. So that is the only ch other challenges. We don't find any other challenge. Uh, so what are the reasons behind uh, less accuracy in identifying crops like soya bean? The only uh, thing is that soya bean uh, crop duration it perfectly synchronizes with the monsoon period. So monsoon is from June to September, our southwest monsoon, and it will be up to first coordinate of October. This crop bio window of soya bean also is June to September. So whole crop season of soya bean is cloudy optical data. If you get cloud free optical data, soya bean uh, delineation is not uh, is possible. So we are depending on microwave data. In the microwave uh, data, crop signatures, crop signatures, there is a lot of uh, confusion. And again, using a combination of microwave and the available optical satellite data, people are working on that. The accuracies have been brought to 75 to 80%. Probably by using the data, let us say uh, the currently available planet data three to five years they have three to five days uh, they have got two days repetitivity five meter data 
with this repeat data cloud cover may be less then with such kind of data the accuracies can be improved uh, sir one of the uh, uh, participants has said that it's very difficult to get correct historical yield data in that case how can we predict accurate yield information and link it to the geospatial side yeah there are two three yield modeling approaches uh, one is if you adopt machine learning models for yield estimation you require very good training data at least for the current and the past years i'm sorry so that means accurately measured yield data is required so if, if you don't have good training data your yield model will not work but there are some semi physical models where you don't require this training data in this when you apply semi physical models and generate the crop yield estimates that you can you can link these estimates with the historical data from the historical data you have to select certain data points which are accurate data points for cross validation or for some calibration purpose in any case for some models very accurate historic yield measurements are required in some models we require historic yield measurement but to a limited extent for example semi physical model is there his modeling approach is altogether different is the radiation use efficiency model there is no training data concept here but we require certain accurate data points once the model is produced to calibrate whether the model is performing all right or not to calibrate the model performance we require certain accurate data points but limited in number so sir yeah how much remote sensing and gis technology is suitable for crops monitoring in a state like uttarakhand as land parcels are present in a very really scattered way and there may be geographical challenges associated with it yeah in the hilly terrain small parcels terrain related problems are there it is a challenge it's a big challenge it's not easy so using satellite data and uh, providing the solutions is uh, is not easy probably you can explore the smartphone data as well as the drone data to certain extent you can try that uh, so how can we use uh, remote sensing and gis technologies uh, in increasing irrigation efficiency and minimizing irrigation losses sir hmm. There's so much work has taken place on improving the performance of irrigation systems, uh, irrigation system performance evaluation using the remote sensing. So one approach is that um, uh, water use efficiency because the computation of uh, actual evapotranspiration using thermal remote sensing data, and then once you calculate the actual EIET is nothing but water consumed. that is water consumption by the crop so this since it depends on thermal data in the kharif season the availability of thermal data is very difficult cloud cover related problems temperature retrieval problems emissivity related issues but in rabi season this was done where the cloud cover problem is not there there are many as i told you there are many studies many, lot of research is published but it has not come into practice because still there are certain limitations to overcome otherwise this approach is practiced actual evapotranspiration using thermal data and then assessing the performance of uh, irrigation systems that is one thing and within the command area the head reach area tail reach area discrepancies crop coverage crop condition crop health in the head reach area and tail reach area these things they are doable they are doable we can use the remote sensing data that will address the problem to certain extent if you want to really go for water use efficiency water consumption you have to adopt a different approach that approach is not fully mature enough to roll it out but there are certain agencies international agencies which have produced the data of water consumption we need to look into those models so is it a correct approach to first perform segmentation using high resolution imagery and then use the segmented output for crop mapping by utilizing open source time series data 
for both optical and SAR sources. Now these are the for crop mapping has to be done at a pixel based crop mapping. Whatever data I use. The segmentation is to create some land parcels. This land parcels and uh, pixel based crop map, they are integrated to provide parcel level crop map. To transform pixel crop map into parcel crop map, you use the segmentation layer. I know this is the field boundaries. This is the field layer. This superimpose on the pixel uh, crop map, transform a pixel crop map into parcel crop map. This is how it should be done. Sir, why do manual surveys still dominate agricultural flood impact assessments despite over three decades of satellite based flood mapping? Is it due to accessibility and trust in geospatial technology among stakeholders like uh, stake, uh, farmers and uh, uh, local authorities? What are the key challenges in bridging these gaps? So, as of now, we stopped at generating flood inundation layers. Afterwards, what work is to be done? Nobody has done in a systematic manner. Therefore, at this point of time, I cannot say because of technology limitations, this work is not carried out. Well, nobody has done that work till now. We were many times we worried about that in MNCFC. So this flood inundation layer, for example, what you saw some flood has happened. This inundation layer has to be intersected with the crop layer. So how much area is under flood, you know, then you should rope in the state agriculture university or some other local university to know what is the crop stage. And then after the inundation, you have to see the satellite images and see is there any recovery, whether the crop continues to be uh, damaged or is there any recovery. And then if it is not recovered, then there are uh, knowledge is available with state universities at the time of heading of rice crop. If inundation happens, what is the loss? So this kind of procedure has to be systematically worked out and somebody has to provide a solution for this. So since nobody has done this work and it is very easy for the patwaris to make some cook some figures and produce some re, uh, some reports because at that point of calamity, the political leaderships also, they are in a hurry to generate the last assessment report and submit to government of India. So actually this is a big gap. Somebody has to work for this. For research purposes, if researchers go and start to collect the ground truth data of agriculture, when they face any local challenges and what is the best way to approach this issue? You don't find any local challenges except in one situation. That situation is when the stubble burning is happening in Punjab and Haryana at that time, don't go to field. They will snatch your mobile and then throw it out somewhere. So don't go at the, during that kind of sensitive periods. In the remaining periods, even if you go to field and take a smartphone photograph, no farmer will object you. We are not faced any challenges. The challenges are if there is any flooding situation, you may not be able to navigate through the field. That is the only logistical challenge, some practical difficulty. Otherwise, we don't find any challenges in ground truth data collection. Uh, sir, uh, can you please suggest any papers related to microwave and optical remote sensing to tackle the cloud cover issues faced? I, I have to check and come back to you right now. Readily, I cannot suggest. There are so many papers. You can Google it. I think you can see cloud patterns and kind of things. Yeah. Also, uh, what is the uh, role of uh, the thermal remote sensing uh, in uh, improving the effectiveness of what I've been discussing so far? I'm talking of the LWR range 8 to 14 micron. See, thermal, uh, some temperature stress indices, 
they are unique to thermal data. For example, canopy temperature. This can be uh, estimated, uh, retrieved through thermal data. This canopy temperature, you relate with the air temperature. What is the difference between these two? That is an indicator of stress. For stress detection, no doubt, it has got certain unique indices. Based on land surface or canopy temperature, you can build some uh, energy balance models to estimate the water consumption, evapotranspiration. And this has also been successfully done in many countries. In India also it has been done uh, by whatever reasons it is, it is not rolled out as a scalable or operational model. Still there are certain difficulties in the, in the retrievals. So there is no doubt thermal has got some uniqueness, but the challenges with thermal data in Kharif season is uh, unique. Those things have to be resolved. One is that uh, water vapor content in the uh, atmosphere the temperature uh, retrieval accuracies and also there is one emissivity factor in temperature emissivity of the features these are certain limitations in the Karib season but in Ravi season yes it can be used but there are no scalable or uh, well demonstrated models till now so you had mentioned about use of mobile phones and smartphones basically for ground truthing ex exercises Sir, are there any specific standards of a mobile phone to ensure that uh, the accuracy aspects do not suffer in that? So in nowadays, everybody, everybody is using smartphones sir. and the GT data collection apps are a huge number of apps are available. Almost every agri-tech company has got their app, GT collection app. In the ministry also, we have Krishi Mapper, one GT collection app is there. Only one thing one has to do is that when you are collecting data using smartphone, you should check the location accuracy of your smartphone. That means you have to wait for uh, one to one and a half minute in the field so that many satellites are locked in, you get more accurate. Uh, location accuracy will be less than 10 meters. If you simply go hurriedly and then collect some data, their spatial uh, location accuracies are hundreds of meters. There are instances where the Madhya Pradesh GT points and then it went on to Gujarat. Odisha GT point, when you put on the map, it got into Chhattisgarh. So Gujarat GT points got into Pakistan. Because these are all the uh, location kind of uh, accuracies, one has to be careful. That's all, nothing more than that. Fair answer. Uh, sir, can the synergy of satellite plus UAV uh, help in addressing the case of Kharif season mapping? ET. Mapping ET? Sir. Uh, you set aside ET for some time, but the synergy between drones and satellite technology, drone imaging and satellite images, it has not happened till now. It has not happened till now, even the other applications. Somebody has to work for this because drones have got certain unique advantages, satellites have unique advantages, but drone surveys over larger areas, they are going to be expensive. How to make a synergy between these two to derive a cost-effective solution? This, this nobody has done till now. This is one important thing. Second important thing is that when you fly the drone over a given area, drone based mapping is not automated till now fully automated so if it is not autom automated extraction of features or crop information from the drone images is one important requirement for the country otherwise if you do some manual things of extracting uh, crop information from the drones it takes a lot of time for one image you can do if you want to for large area adoption it is difficult so automated extraction has to be done and then the drone images automatically ex extracting and then superimposing on the georeferenced cadastral layer and producing the information at farmer survey number level using drones. That also it has not happened till now. I think these are all the gaps where there is a lot of uh, scope. So many of the principal reasons why the uh, the integration of the drone imagery and the uh, the satellite imagery, what are the major challenges because of which it is really not picked up based on your field experiences? Sir. I 
am not sure what are the actual somebody has to do the work and report it then we know the challenges but nobody has for example crop monitoring is to be done when there is a cloud cover things i don't get the satellite data i will use the drone image at these crop stages i will use the drone image in the remaining crop stages i will use the satellite image so what is the calibration between these two somebody has to work this is a problem a research problem and if they can bring some synergy between these two i think it will open up new opportunities now as of now people are seeing drone as a stand alone technology but that should not be the case uh, right sir we have uh, finished all the questions uh, uh, thank you very much sir uh, that was very very insightful and good learning experience for all of us and we are uh, much grateful to you for sparing your valuable time and sharing uh, the wealth of knowledge that and experience that you have gathered with all of us uh, we will continue to engage with you sir for further guidance based on uh, uh, the lot of queries that we have received from people we will forward them to you uh, some people want to get connected with you so we shall take the liberty of uh, connecting them to you directly sir and uh, uh, thank you very much sir would you like uh, dg would like to make his closing remarks now thank you dr murthy it's been really special for us to have you here to listen to you and to others to get a perception of what your vision of this decision support system is because this is something which you have really uh, worked very hard in the ministry of agriculture to develop it and bring it and i am sure it will shape up to be a strong dpi in agriculture for the nation for the nation uh, we in ispa will continue to engage you uh, because the kind of talk you have given today and the depth of information and knowledge you have uh, it is very important that we can spread it amongst our members amongst the larger community which is interested in this uh, but a very very special thanks to you for what you have been able to provide us so thank you thank you very much there is one last question for, from dr sultan sir dr sultan uh, over to you dr sultan uh, dr sultan sir you can ask your question sir yeah it is not a question not just i uh, compliment to dr murthy last year uh, you said that this is a new opportunity maybe opening drone plus satellite merge applications so murthy sir uh, you understand we are working on both the way so we are experimental we started for last one year we already identified two sites one is a karnal one is a hisar so both application we are working that result is uh, under the final analytical analytical way same area we use the multiple satellite data like uh, sentinel planet or many others then same area same date pass of the satellite probably we use the drone also for the multiple spectrum so let's we discuss in detail uh, once we come out this results so uh, you are the first uh, uh, mentor on that way so that's my only submission i don't have any question this is a basically my continuity yeah. submission to murthy sir yeah yeah it's a good effort i think your center is always uh, uh, vibrant to take up these initiatives it's a good effort we are keen to see the results yeah uh, it's very interesting it's a good learning for me also from your efforts so every month we are tasking that particular all 20 uh, last week of like month na so same date we acquired the drone image great yeah so good effort thank you thank you dr sultan and uh, once again a special thanks to dr murthy on behalf of rispa and all who have attended here and i'm so happy to the kind of number of questions we had the number of people who have participated this gives us motivation to call more experts for this expert talk and work in this entire space domain which is 
very important for the growth of India. Thank you, gentlemen. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you very much, DG Saab. And uh, look forward to have continued association with ISPA. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks to all participants also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Jai Hind.